to welcome you uh, once again to Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel here in El Paso, Texas, Far West Texas. Today is Sunday, August 8th, uh, 2021. And um, we're so glad that you take the took the time this morning to spend some time in worship. And now we're going to get into the Word in just a few minutes here. we will be watching via the live stream or if you're here in person as well. And you want to learn more about our church, I do want to invite you to visit our website at fvccelp.com. And uh, when you go to our church website, there's a whole bunch of information on there. And I'll just kind of give you the abridged version this morning. Um, you know, I would direct you to the upper tabs of the, the website. I'm not sure we're going to get it pulled up here. And if we don't, that's okay. Uh, but on the site menu, you click on there, that'll take you through the whole website. You can navigate to the entire website. That's kind of like the, the table of contents for the website there. And um, if you want to learn more about Pastor Angel, you want to learn more about the church, our statement of faith, our mission a statement, those types of things, you can click on that and you can read those. And of course, our social media, our media tab as well, uh, you can click on that and it'll take you to past studies and just the different platforms that those studies are on. And we do want to encourage you all to spread the gospel by sharing those messages on your own uh, personal social media uh, platforms. And uh, here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, we don't have a formal offering. However, as the Lord leads you to give, we do have the Agape Box in the back. So if you're here in person and uh, you're desiring to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, you can use the Agape Box in the back. You can also give electronically. At the very bottom of the website, there's um, an avenue to do that through PayPal, and uh, you can give in that way. And of course, if you're uh, on any of our social media uh, you know, sites, you can give through there as well. PayPal is actually linked to all of those right under the video description, and you can give uh, through that avenue. And of course, the Lord loves a cheerful giver, so you don't want to give grudgingly or forcingly. Um, that's between you and the Lord, but we do want to let you know that your, your donations, your gifts to Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel are used solely to spread the Word of God, to spread the Gospel, and to point people uh, to Jesus. Now, just some general announcements for the week. We will have a men's study here on Wednesday evening at 6.30 p.m. Uh, come by for a time of fellowship. We'll have some food this week, and um, also we'll be going through... Um, the, the days of creation. So uh, we are currently in the book of Genesis. If you are interested, you can contact the church or you can come, uh, just come on Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. here um, at, the, at the church. And um, we also have a youth group here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. If you are interested, if you're middle school, high school age, and um, you're, you're finding a ministry to connect with, I do want to encourage you to come check out Unashamed Ministry. We do meet after announcements we're currently going to the Gospel of Luke, and uh, we are going to be planning a monthly outing. Um, we'll do something fun. I know some of you young people have already started school, uh, but we do want to continue in fellowship and growing in the Lord together. So if that's something you're desiring or looking for, uh, check us out here at uh, Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We also have children's ministry. If you have uh, young children, maybe that's keeping you from coming to church. Don't let that keep you from coming. Bring them with you. And uh, Children's Ministry also meets right after announcements in the back there. And um, for more information, like if there's more announcements, I would say go to the website during the week and uh, you, can, uh, you can look at the, the calendar. And um, if you want to get in contact with us, I forgot to mention this earlier, there's a section there on the website, uh, contact us link in the site menu, and it'll take you to that part of the website. You can fill in any prayer requests, any information, and we'll get back to you um, as soon as possible. So I think that is the extent of the announcements. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and pass it to Pastor Angel. For those watching, listening again, thank you for joining us, uh, taking time out of your day, whether you're watching this live or later on you're watching the recording or hearing the audio. Thank you again for spending um, some time out of your day to listen to this message. And hopefully everyone here, everyone watching, listening will be blessed by the time we're done here and um, you'll have a fresh vision of uh, this world and, you know, your life and just, you know, what God has called you to be. So today we're going to be in Second Samuel chapter 11 and 12. And I've titled today's message, From Sinner to Conqueror. Now, whenever we read, hear, or watch the biographical life 
of an admirable historical figure, for the most part, we typically are given the best of that person's life. Yeah, you may hear the struggles and the issues they had to get from point A to, you know, them to become an actual historical, famous historical figure, you know, whether it's one of the founding fathers or, you know, an important civil rights leader um, or whether it's, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe some millionaire philanthropist, you know, um, it's usually, you know, usually given just the good stuff, the good parts of that person's life. All the skeletons in their closet are for the most part left out. And in order for to, to make us believe that he or she pretty much left a perfect life, the good thing about the Word of God, the good thing about the Bible is that it always tells the truth about people. It should encourage us to know that even the best men and women in the Bible had their faults and their failures, just as we do. And yet the Lord, in His sovereign grace, was able to use them to accomplish his purposes. For example, Noah was a man of faith and obedience, and yet he got drunk. Twice, Abraham lied about his wife, and Jacob lied, both, uh, lied to both his father, Isaac, and his brother Esau. Moses lost his temper when he struck the rock, and Peter lost the courage and denied Christ three times. Well, so far in Second Samuel, we've pretty much just seen the great things that David has accomplished and, and how that led to him becoming one of the greatest kings on earth. Well, here now, David's entire life, right when he's at the, the pinnacle of his life, when he's conquered, when he's won things, when he's the top of his game, his life will begin to shift towards a downwards trend that will be marked with a series of trouble and heartache. And so in today's chapters that we're going to be looking at, we're going to see seven stages in David's experience with sin and forgiveness. The first th three will be in chapter 11, and there we're going to see how the man after God's own heart committed adultery and then murdered a man to cover up that sin. Then in chapter 12, we'll, we'll be covering the other four, and there we'll see how for at least nine months, David refused to confess his sins but when God spoke to him, he sought the Lord and made a new beginning. And yet, even with that new start, he still had to deal with the consequences of his sin. Because, as Charles Spurgeon said, God does not allow his children to sin successfully. So, what I hope you all get from this message is that just as David suffered the consequences of his sins for the rest of his life, you will as well if you rebel against him, if you rebel against God. For the Lord chastens those he loves and seeks to make them obedient. The good things that you receive in life, you pay for in advance. For God prepares us for what He has prepared for us. But the evil things you do are paid for on the installment plan. And bitter is the sorrow brought by the consequences of forgiven sin. Uh, so as we go through these chapters, keep in mind the words of Paul, uh, the words of advice from Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Whoever thinks he stands must be careful not to fall. 
So before we get into chapter 11 of 2 Samuel, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us powerfully this morning. Lord God, we are thankful that you brought us here. We, we hope that the, our time of, of singing and worship, Lord, that was a, just a sweet-smelling aroma to you, Lord. So now as we get into the next part of our time with you, our worship, Lord, of, of hearing your word and hearing the message that you helped me to prepare, Lord, I pray that you will speak truths into our lives. Uncomfortable truths, hard truths, Lord. And just reminders as well, Lord, of, of things that we you know, maybe have forgotten about and Lord, we want to know you more. We want to hear from you more. We want to fall in love with you more. So now, as we get into your word, Lord, speak to us again, to our hearts. Plant the seeds that you need to plant. Or, yeah, plant the seeds that you need to plant, Lord, and make it grow. Soften the hearts and minds of everyone, Lord. May we glorify you in this next time we have. Pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Second Samuel chapter 11. The word of God says, In the spring, when kings march out to war, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel. They destroyed the Ammonites and Bethsaida, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and strolled around the roof of his palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing a very beautiful woman. So David sent someone to inquire about her. And he said, Isn't this Bathsheba, daughter of Iliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? David sent messengers to get her, and when she came to him, he slept with her. Now, she had just been purifying herself from her uncleanliness. Afterwards, she returned home. The woman conceived and sent word to inform David, I am pregnant. David sent orders to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the troops were doing and how the war was going. Then he said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace and a gift from the king followed him. But Uriah slept at the door of the palace with all his master servants. He did not go down to his house. When it was reported to David, Uriah didn't go home, David questioned Uriah, Haven't you just come from a journey? Why didn't you go home? Uriah answered to David, The ark, Israel, and Judah are dwelling in tents, and my master Joab and his soldiers are camping in the open field. How can I enter my house to eat and drink and sleep with my wife? As surely as you live, and by your life, I will not do this. Stay here today also, David said to Uriah. And tomorrow I will, I will send you back. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem that day and the next. Then David invited Uriah to eat and drink with him. And David got him drunk. He went out in the evening to lie down on his cot with his master's servants, but he did not go home. The next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In the letter he wrote, Put Uriah in the front of the fiercest fighting, then withdraw from him so that he is struck down and dies. When Joab was besieging the city, he put Uriah in the place where he knew the best enemy soldiers were. Then the men of the city came out and attacked Joab, and some of the men from David's, and some of the men from David's soldiers fell in battle. Uriah the Hittite also died. Joab then sent someone to report to David all the details of the battle. He commanded the messenger, When you finish telling the king all the details of the battle, if the king answer, answer gets stirred up when he asks you, Why did you get so close to the city to fight? Didn't you realize they would shoot from the top of the wall at, at Thebes, who struck Abimelech, son of Jerub, Jerubasheth, didn't, didn't a woman drop an upper millstone 
on him from the top of the wall so that he died? Why did you get so close to the wall? Then say, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Then the messenger left. When he arrived, he reported to David all that Joab had sent him, sent him to tell. The messenger reported to David, the man gained the advantage over us and came out against us in the field, but we counterattacked right up to the entrance of the city gate. However, the archers shot down on your servants from the top of the wall, and some of the king's servants died. Your servant Uriah the Hittite also died, is also dead. David told the messenger, say this to Joab, don't let this matter upset you because the sword devours all alike. Intensify your fight against the city and demolish it. Encourage him. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband Uriah had died, she mourned for him. When the time of mourning ended, David had her brought to his house. She, came, she became his wife and bore him a son. However, the Lord considered what David had done to be evil. The first stage of David's experience with sin and forgiveness is in the, it's found in the first three verses of this chapter. And there we learn how his sin was conceived and also illustrates the truth found in James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. And it all begins with an important piece of information that could have kept everything from this chapter and the following chapter from happening. In the spring, when kings march out to war, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel. And then at the end of that, the end there it says, but David remained in Jerusalem. Now, we know from the previous chapter that, you know, David, there were some exemptions made and, and, and David was allowed at certain times to, to be back home while he sent his troops out to battle. But he didn't have to. It was more of an option for him. Now, the text doesn't necessarily tell us why he decided to stay in Jerusalem rather than to help the army during their battle with the Ammonites of Rabbah. But there is a saying that's often true. When someone is supposed to be doing something but isn't doing anything, the devil will find work for idle hands to do. See, idleness isn't just the absence of activity. For all of us need a regular rest. Idleness is also activity to no purpose. When David finished his evening nap, he should have immediately found something to do, a project for his kingdom. Or if you wanted to take a walk, he should have invited someone that he trusted to walk with him. If you are idle, be not solitary, wrote Samuel Johnson. If you're solitary, be not idle. See, had David followed that counsel, he would have saved himself and his family from a great deal of heartache. The moment David laid aside his armor, he took the first step toward moral defeat. And the same principle applies to believers today. Without the helmet of salvation, we don't think like saved people. And without the breastplate of righteousness, we have nothing to protect the heart. Lacking the girdle of truth, we easily believe, we easily believe the lies. And we can get away with this. And without the word of the, the, the sword of the word and the shield of faith, 
we're helpless before the enemy. Without prayer, we have no power. As for the shoes of peace, David walked in the midst of battles for the rest of his life. So you see, in the end, he was safer on the battlefield than on the roof of his palace. And let me also add this. You really can't blame a guy if an attractive woman comes into his line of vision. But, the man, but if that man deliberately lingers, stares too long in order to feed into his lust, into his lust, yeah, he's asking for trouble. Let me remind you what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, 28. You have heard that it, it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So when David paused and took that longer second look at this woman that was bathing herself, his imagination went to work. And it started to give birth to sin. See, that would have been a good time for him to do a 180, a 180 degree turn and walk away immediately. Leave, leave the roof of his palace for a much safer place. But by lingering, staring and looking and lusting, David tempted himself. And when he sent messengers for Bathsheba, he tempted her. He tempted Bathsheba. And by giving into the flesh, he tempted the Lord. Oh, it's not a big deal if I put my hand in someone else's cookie jar. But here's the truth. When God forbids something and calls it sin, we shouldn't try to get more information on it or about it. Paul wrote this in Romans chapter 16, verse 19. I want you to be wise about what is good and yet innocent about what is evil. Now, if David knew what the law said about adultery, why did he send someone to inquire about her? Because in his heart, he had already, he had already taken possession of her. And now he was anxious to have a rendezvous with her, to have a meetup with her, to talk to her, to get to know her more. And see, once that happened, and once he learned that Bathsheba was a married woman, that should have been the end of it. It should have been it. It should have stopped him from going on with his evil plan. Furthermore, as soon as he discovered that she was the wife of one of his courageous soldiers who was out in the battlefield, he should have gone to the Lord, fallen on his face, and cried out to God for mercy. Lord, I'm so sorry that I lusted after this woman. This woman belongs to one of those men that's fighting for me, fighting for this nation. Forgive me, Lord, for having these thoughts, for considering this. He should have, right then and there, asked for forgiveness. So it wasn't... As if, he was, as if he was ignorant or unaware that the law said in Exodus chapter 20 not to commit adultery. And had he remembered that it also says there in Exodus 20 not to covet your neighbor's wife and applied it into his own heart, he wouldn't have asked for her. You then see in verse 4, the next stage of David's experience the act of the actual act of committing sin 
sin being born. Again, it was first conceived, now it's being born. Now, one of the puzzles in this event is the willingness of Bathsheba to go with the messengers and to submit to David's desires. Now, there's no indication that she was forced. And so, if she did go willingly, didn't she stop to consider that she was more likely to get pregnant right after having her monthly cycle, monthly period. Again, a lot more questions could be asked, but it's really hard to answer, to have the answers to them, to those questions, this side of heaven. But regardless, the sin of David's lust had been conceived and was about to be born, a sin that would bring with it sorrow and death. According to Proverbs, David uh, was about to be robbed, burned, disgraced, and destroyed just for a few minutes of forbidden pleasure. Now for a minute, uh, I want to address the men, the guys that are either they're here watching, listening, um, and I know in there's certain occasions this also applies to, to, to women, but I mean, guys, we know ourselves and women also know us. But um, if you're married, a few minutes of pleasure is not worth losing everything for. This is something that, you know, um, that a, man, a lot of men have, you know, because again, they've fallen, they've uh, fallen for their, or have given into their flesh, have lost families, have lost their finances, have lost a lot for just a few minutes of putting your hand in someone else's cookie jar. It's not worth it. The pain, the heartache, not just for your wife, but also to your children. You know, a lot of people don't consider, they just see themselves and whatever feels best for them. It's that selfish feel, that selfishness. I don't care about her. Well, I'm not even thinking about her. I'm just want to do whatever feels good for me at this particular moment. Well, again, those few minutes of pleasure can be disastrous for not just you, but for everyone else around you. It's not worth it. Our Lord said in Mark chapter 10, verse 9, what God is joining together, let no one separate. This means that God has brought this woman into your life to be your spouse. If it wasn't his will, if it, it wouldn't have happened. There was a reason why, again, he brought you both together and, and you and her made a vow before God to be exclusive to one another, to be nobody else's but each other. And so anyone coming in, trying to ruin that, anything coming in, trying to cause a division or put a wedge in between you and your wife, get rid of it quickly. Regardless of, you know, if you're not getting along with her, if things are bad right now, you know, understand this, that It can work out. If you think, again, oh, I don't feel like I love her anymore. Well, it's beyond feelings. It's beyond your marriage with this woman. It should be beyond these emotions. It should be, you know, just this is a woman that I've 
now vowed to care for, to watch over, to love. It says, it also says in Proverbs chapter 5, verse 15 to 23, it says this. It's again speaking of, of men, married men. Drink water from your own cistern, water flowing from your own well. Should your springs flow in the streets, streams of water in the public squares, they should be for you alone. They should be for you alone and not for you to share with strangers. Let your fountain be blessed and take pleasure in, your, in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful fawn, let her breasts always satisfy you. Be lost in her love forever. Why, my son, would you be infatuated with a forbidden woman or embrace the breast of a stranger? For a man's ways are before the Lord's eyes, and he considers all his paths. A wicked man's iniquities entrap him. He is entangled in the ropes of his own sin. He will die because there is no instruction and be lost because of his great stupidity. God takes the marriage vows seriously. He takes seriously those vows that both the husband and the wife have made, even if they don't. Well, at the end of our passage here, the sin of David and Bathsheba was born when they decided to have sexual relations with one another which then leads to the experience of David's sin in verses 5 through 27. And there we see the cover-up stage of the sin. Once she found out she was pregnant, and those are the words that an adulterer does not want to hear, would not want to hear, and, had an, and when she informed David that it was his, he immediately devised a plan to cover it all up. After recalling Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, from the battlefield, he made two attempts to get him to go home so that he could sleep with his wife. So that, again, if she, you know, he can... She, they, everyone can say that, oh, that's his child that she's pregnant with. But both times, he refused to go home because his fellow soldiers were still out in the field fighting. They were still in this fierce battle with the Amen, uh, Ammonites. And it didn't seem right for him to be at home have a, you know, a good meal and to be intimate with his wife. It just didn't seem right to him while they were out doing that, that he would be doing this. Well, those two times didn't work, so David then tried to get him drunk and then to go home. So again, he could be with Bathsheba. But he still didn't go home. You see, that's how strong he held on to his convictions. He was a soldier at heart. And even when alcohol tore down his defenses, he remained faithful to his calling. So when that didn't work, David came up with one last-ditch effort to cover up his sin. He wrote a memo to Joab commanding that Uriah uh, to, be re to be returned to the front line and then to be abandoned to the enemy by an unexpected Israeli withdrawal. Iron ironically, Uriah was the bearer of his own tidings of doom. This plan succeeded. Uriah was surrounded and was slain. Now, ordinarily, David would have been upset by the news of casualties he would have wondered why, he would have wondered at Israel's indiscretion in fighting under Rob's wall. He would have thought of it as a blunder, as a military 
mistake, as a strategic mistake, the same kind which we, it, which the same kind that is seen in Judges chapter 9 that had cost Abimelech, son of Gideon, his life. So Joab instructed the courier who bore the news to inform the king specifically. Don't forget, yeah, tell him all this happened, but don't forget to tell him that Uriah had, has died. He knew this would calm David, David's anguish. Well, sure enough, David's response to the news was predictable. He told the messenger to tell Joab that in circumstances such as war, life and death are matters of blind chance. His instruction back to Joab was only that the siege at Rabbah be even more aggressive. Bathsheba soon learned of her husband's tragic death. And so after the customary time of mourning, she moved into the king's palace in time to bear their son. But we learn here, again in the passage, that the Lord was displeased and set events into motion that would trouble David till his death. Now this is the first mention that, that this is the first time that God is mentioned in this chapter. See, God witnessed every event and read every intent of every heart, but his displeasure is only implied until this specific statement. David's state of heart in the inter intervening year is reflected in Psalm chapter 32, verses 1 through 4. How happy is the one whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How happy is the man the Lord does not charge with sin and whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones became brittle and my groaning and my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. Your strength was drained as in the summer's heat. My strength was drained as in the summer's heat. This psalm shows that David was under immense conviction, intense conviction during this entire time. And all the joy that he had quickly evaporated. It was gone. See, David knew the stress and agony of living a double life, a false life. He found no relief until he repented and got right with God again. One commentator wrote, the better the man, the dearer the price he pays for a short season of sinful pleasure. David was in a terrible place where he had too much sin in him to be happy in God. But he had too much of God in him to be happy in sin. Spurgeon said this, when there, when there is the most necessity for confession, there's often the greatest tardiness in making it. It would so in David's case. I think I can see why you could not have gone straight away from the sin to confession. For sin prevented the confession. The sin blinded the eye, solidified the conscience, and stupefied the entire spiritual nature of David. He was lost. He was, he was so convicted about his sin, he couldn't be happy. And that's what happens to Christians. If you're really truly a believer in Christ and, and know about him, and you're not going to be able to sin and be joyful about it. It's going to, you're going to know. You're going to be convicted. You're just going to be struggling with it. You're going to be, you know, in a case like this, if, you know, you're committing adultery, it's, you know, it's going to eat up at you every time you're sitting at the dinner table with your entire family. 
again, it's not worth it. So now in the next chapter we're about to read, we're going to see that because of, because David was a man, was a man after God's own heart, God drew David to repentance and restoration. So let's turn to chapter 12 and read the next four experiences of David's, or the next four steps in David's experience with sin and forgiveness. Second Samuel chapter 12. So the Lord sent Nathan to David. When he arrived, he said to him, there were two men in a certain city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had, had very large flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one small ewe lamb that he had brought, that he had bought. He raised her and she grew up with him and with his children. From his meager food, she would eat. From his cup, she would drink. And in his arms, she would sleep. She was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man could not bring himself to take one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for his guest. David was infuriated with the man and said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die because he had done, because he has done this thing and showed no pity. He must pay four lambs for that lamb. Nathan replied to David, you are that man. This is what the Lord God of Israel says. I anoint you king over Israel and I rescued you from Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. And I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that was enough, I would have given you even more. Why then have you despised the Lord's command by doing what I've considered evil? You struck down Uriah, the Hittite, with the sword and took his wife as your own wife. Murdered him with the Ammonite sword. Now, therefore, the sword will never leave your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own wife. This is what the Lord says. I'm going to bring disaster on you from your own family. I will take your wives and give them to another before your very eyes, and he will sleep with them in broad daylight. You acted in secret, but I will do this before all Israel and in broad daylight. Then Nathan replied to David, and the Lord has, then Nathan replied to David, and the Lord has taken your sin, you will not die. However, because you treated the Lord with contempt in this matter, thus the son born to you will die. Then Nathan went home. The Lord struck the baby that Uriah's wife had born to David. Then he became, and he became deathly ill. David pleaded with God for the boy. Sorry, this is real, you know, it's a real story. And, um, David pleaded with God for the boy. He fasted, went home, and spent the night lying on the ground. The elders of the house stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he was unwilling and would not eat or eat anything with them. On the seventh day, the baby died, but David's servants were afraid to tell him the baby was dead. They said, look, while the baby was alive, we spoke to him and he wouldn't listen to us. So how can we tell him the baby is dead? He may do something desperate. When David saw that his servants were whispering to each other, he guessed that the baby was dead. So he asked his servants, is the baby dead? He is dead, they replied. When David got up from the ground, he washed, anointed himself, changed his clothes, went to the Lord's house and worshiped. Then he went home and requested something to eat. So they served him food and he ate. 
His servants asked him, why have you done this? While the baby was alive, you fasted and wept. But when he, when he died, you got up and ate food. He answered, while the baby was alive, I fasted and wept because I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious and just let him live. But now that he's dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I'll go to him, but he will never return to me. Then David comforted his wife, Bathsheba. He went to her and slept with her. She gave birth to a son and named him Solomon. The Lord loved him and sent a message to the prophet Nathan, who named him Jedidiah because of the Lord. Joab fought against Rabbah of the Ammonites and captured the royal fortress. Then Joab sent messengers to David to say, I have fought against Rabbah and have also captured the water supply. Now therefore assemble the rest of the troops. Lay siege to the city and capture it. Capture it. Otherwise I will be the one to capture the city and it will be named after me. So David assembled all the troops and went to Rabbah. He fought against it and captured it. He took the crown from the head of the king and it was placed on David's head. The crown weighed 75 pounds of gold and it had, and it had precious stones in it. In addition, David took away a large quantity of plunder from the city. He removed the people who were in the city and put them to work with saws, iron picks, and iron axes, and to labor in brick making. He did the same with all the Ammonite cities. Then he and his troops returned to Jerusalem. The first 14 verses of chapter 12 is David's fourth experience, the confessing. Sometime after the birth of Bathsheba's son, Nathan the prophet told David a story of a rich man who, in spite of having everything, stole a poor man's neighbor's only you, basically a female lamb, to provide a feast for a guest. Enraged, David pronounced that man who would do such, uh, who would do such a despicable thing that he, he should die. In addition, he said the rich man must restore four lambs for the one stolen, for not, for not even the rich man's debt could compensate for the poor man's property loss. Nathan's reply to all this was a bombshell. You are that man, the Lord. Uh, you are that man, he said. And the Lord had given everything to David, but he had taken, as it were, the pet lamb of a poor neighbor. David will now suffer the sword as Uriah, Uriah and David's wives be taken from him as Bathsheba had been stolen from the Hittite. And this would eventually be fulfilled by Absalom, David's own son, when he lay with David's concubines. And we'll read about that when we get to chapter 16. But David's shame would be even greater because in contrast to David's sin in secret, all these things would happen in broad daylight and for the public, for everyone to see. One may wonder, perhaps, why David was not punished with death as he had so sternly advocated for the guilty man. Adultery and murder, both were sufficient cause for the execution, even for a king. The answer surely lies in the genuine and contrite repentance with which David expressed. Not only in the presence of Nathan, but more fully, in Psalm 51, yes, his sin was heinous, but the grace of God was more sufficient to forgive and restore him, as Nathan could testify. Because of Christ's finished work on the cross, God is able to save lost sinners and forgive disobedient saints. And the sooner 
the lost and disobedient turn to the Lord, repent, the better off they're going to be. Earlier I read what David said in Psalm chapter 32, verses 1 through 4. Let me now read to you what he said next in verses 5 and 6. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and you did not conceal my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you took away my guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is faithful pray to you at the time that you may be found. When great floodwaters come, they will not reach him. And so, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't done so, heed the words found in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call to him while he is near. At the end of the, that message, if that's something you'd like to do, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. And now as I go on, the next, from verses 15 to 23, we see David's fifth experience, the chastening. Now chastening isn't punishment delivered by, let's say, an angry judge who wants to uphold the law. Rather, it's difficulty permitted by a loving father who wants his children to submit to his will and develop godly character. Expression of his love for Christians. Chastening isn't always God's response to our disobedience. Sometimes he's preparing us for challenges yet to come. Almost, let's say for example, a high school coach preparing a football team for the championship game. So here's the bottom line. If there were no painful consequences to sin or subsequent chastening from the hand of God, what kind of irresponsible world would we be living in? In our story here, we're told that shortly after the interview with Nathan, a child became deathly ill. And despite David's intense fasting and prayer, the baby died within a week. Only then did David cease his mourning, wash, worship, and eat, contrary to the custom and much to the amazement of his servants. So David's response is classic. While the baby was alive, I fasted and wept because I thought, who knows, Lord may be gracious to me and let him live. But now that he's dead, Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will never return to me. David here understands the finality of death. Any further petition or acts for that child is unnecessary. Good. But he also says this in verse 23. I'll go to him, but he will never return to me. This reflects his conviction that the dead cannot return to life as it was. Rather, rather, it is the living who go to the dead. It also confirms David's expectation that he will see and recognize his son in a future life in the future life. And so where was David eventually going to go? Where did he know for a fact that he was going? Well, he tells us, I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. And so my question to you is this, where will you go at the end? Of this life. Bible says there's only two places. Eternity and eternal joy with the Lord or eternal condemnation in hell. Where there is suffering. All the time, every single day. 
you can see this five stars L L is going to be a lot more is it, is it una, unimaginable I'll tell you this I'd rather be living in, in the house of the Lord for all of these things we were getting the told the Bible tells us that there will be joy there will be no more tears we just be embraced by our Heavenly Father. And so, the, what we see next in verses 24 25, David experiences comforting. No matter how devastating the chastening of our, the chastening hand of our Lord, our loving Father makes us feel, there's comfort available from the Lord. And this is what the Lord does next for David. We're told in verse 24 that Bathsheba gave birth to another son, Solomon, who was destined to succeed his father as king. We're also told in the following verse that through the prophet Nathan, God gave child an additional name, the additional name of Jedidiah, which means of Jehovah. Back in chapter 7, God had told David that his son would be born and that he would, that he would have a son and he would build, and that the son would build a temple. He would keep, and he kept that promise. And so now every time David and Bathsheba looked at Solomon, he reminded them that God had forgiven their past and guaranteed their plans for a future. So you can do the same when you look at Jesus, when you look upon Jesus, knowing that, again, he has nails, nail scars on his hands and feet. He did all that. He suffered all that to forgive you of your sins. Forgive you of your past and to guarantee you a future. You just have to accept it. You just have to believe in Him, confess Him as your Lord and Savior. And He will give you a better hope, a better future. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 2 says, Let us lay aside every hindrance and sin that so easily ensnared us, ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And in Ephesians 1.7, it also says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. The final experience David had in his journey of sin and forgiveness is conquering. And there in verses 26 to 31, tells us in, in the meantime, the, Ammon, the Ammonite war went well for Joab. He had all but captured the Ammonite capital, Rabbah, having taken the royal citadel and the waters and the city's water supply. And now in order that David might get the credit for this fall, Joab urged the king to lead the final assault himself. This David did. He sacked the city of its wealth, including the 75-pound golden crown of the Ammonite king. David also put the survivors to work, using saws, iron picks, and axes, and working as brickmakers. And then he returned to Jerusalem. Just as God in his grace gave David victory through, though he had, even though he had been a rebellious man, God can give you victory through Jesus Christ. Even though you've been a rebellious, even though you've been rebellious and disobedient. Isaiah 53, verse 5 says, he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquity. 
punishment for our peace was on him and we are healed by his wounds. So as I, again, I close here, let, let me just quickly review these seven experiences of David's journey of sin and forgiveness. Sin was conceived. Sin was born. Sin was covered up. Sin was confessed. God chastened the sinner. God comforted the sinner. The sinner became a conqueror. And I, well, Chris, if you're a believer today, I hope you can see the similarities with, with what David experienced here and what Christ did for you. Or you came to, to Christ and how, again, you are now a conqueror in Christ once you accepted him. I don't know about you, but I know that I'm comforted by the creator of this universe. When I start to think about all the horrible things I've done in my past, it does bring me comfort to know that he loves me personally. And that all that stuff has been wiped away. And I've been watched clean. A little boy visiting his grandparents was given this first slingshot. He had great fun playing in the woods. He would take aim and let the stone fly, but he never hit a thing. Then on his way home for, for lunch, he cut through the backyard and saw grandmother's pet duck. He took aim and let the stone fly. It went straight to the mark, and to his horror, the duck fell dead. The boy panicked. In desperation, he took the dead duck and hid it in a wood pile. Then he saw his sister Sally standing by the corner of the house. She had seen the whole thing. They went to lunch. Sally said nothing. After lunch, grandmother said, Okay, Sally, let's clear your table and wash the dishes. Sally said, Oh, grandmother, Johnny, oh, grandmother, Johnny said he wanted to help you in the kitchen today. Didn't you, Johnny? And then she whispered to him, Remember the duck. So Johnny did the dishes. Later in the day, grandfather called the children to go fishing. Grandmother said, I'm sorry, but Sally can't go. She has to stay here and help me clean the house and get supper. Sally smiled and said, that's all been taken care of. Johnny said he wanted to help today. Didn't you, Johnny? And then she whispered, remember the duck. This went on for several days. Johnny did all the chores, his and those assigned to Sally. Finally, he could stand it no longer, so he went to his grandmother and confessed all. She took him in his arms and said, I know, Johnny. I was standing at the kitchen window and saw the whole thing. And because I love you, I forgave you. And knowing that I love you, and I would always forgive you. I wondered just how long you would let, let Sally make a save of you. Church, if we don't confess our sin, we become slaves to our guilt. But there's no need to do that. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, ready to forgive our sins. In his righteousness, he may deal with us severely, even after he has forgiven us. But as Romans chapter 8, verse 29 says, we can trust that he always has our ultimate good in mind. We can submit and, and worship him, even when he sends afflictions into his lives. Don't deal with your sin by removing the windshield wipers, by continuing in sin to dodge the consequences. Don't try to cover it up. You will be miserably enslaved to guilt. Deal with it. Confess it to the Lord and to those you've wronged, and by submitting to God's dealings with you. You've heard this. You have your need to confess your sin. I want to lead you in a prayer to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You come to the cross and ask Him 
forgive you for sins, that you must recognize the sin and that you may need of forgiveness. So if you're at that point and you're ready to confess, no longer have these guilty feelings. Wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. If you're able to, yes, you can even kneel down if you want to. With all sincerity, pray this. Lord Jesus, I know and confess that I'm a sinner, and I ask you to forgive me. I now believe that you died for my sins, and that three days later you rose from the dead. So now I repent of those sins, Lord, of all my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. I accept that forgiveness, and I thank you again for saving me. Now, fill me, Lord, with the Holy Spirit. Let me know you more. Let me fall in love with you more. So let me hear and understand your word, that you may help guide me in this, in my newborn again, Lord. In your name, amen. We pray that. Welcome to the family of God. I want to invite you to get a hold of us or ask you to get a hold of us so we can help you in the next step. Um, maybe send you a Bible. I want to also invite you here locally. We want to invite you to Fresh Vision, Calvary Chapel here in Oceanside, Paso. If you need more information, go to the website, call me, my address is there. Um, it's also on Facebook, social media, but um, yeah, that's what the Lord wants to see. He wants to see life change, that confession, that repentance, yeah, and that new life. Thank you for taking time to watch this message, and I hope that we see you again, or that you will check us out again next week as we continue on with this second time in chapter uh, 13. Um, in the meantime, um, be a salt and light wherever you're at, and may the Lord give you blessings. Goodbye and farewell.